Thanks, Brian. I remember some time ago, um, I was having a health issue. I had a big bump forming on my hand, on the back of my hand. And I was curious as to what it was, uh, and so I started to look up my symptoms on the internet. <laughs> you laugh because you know that's a big mistake, all right? Because the more I looked it up, the more anxious I got. Because one website said it could be nothing, another website said it could be everything. Which was it? So I finally gave in, and I went to see a doctor. And of course, I told him, well, I saw this, and I saw that, and they said this, and they said that. And the doctor listened to everything I said, then took a look at me, asked me some questions, and then drew me some pictures. And in the end, the doctor said, it will be okay. Now, all the words on the internet gave me nothing but anxiety, and all the words from the doctor led me to peace. What was the difference? The doctor's words had a sense of authority. After sitting with him, I knew he knew what he was talking about, and it brought me peace and comfort instead of anxiety. And I wonder if you felt that way before. Maybe it wasn't not a doctor that comforted you in that way. You might have had different experiences with doctors. Maybe it was a therapist instead. You went to see a therapist, and the words that they said gave you peace and comfort. Maybe it was a judge. The ruling that they made brought you comfort and peace in your life. Maybe it was a parent, something they told you. Or maybe it was your friend who knows more about baking than you do and brought you peace and comfort after you thought you messed everything up. If you felt before how somebody whose words are spoken with authority can bring you peace, then you have a good grip on what's going on in the passage that we read today. Because the whole theme of this passage is the authority of the words of Jesus Christ. Verse 31 begins by telling us this, that Jesus went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath he taught the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. The scholars say back then the average rabbi or teacher would quote other rabbis and teachers to make a point. They would say, well, somebody said this and another person said that, therefore this I'm telling you. Sort of like how I spoke to my doctor, and I said, well, this website says this, and that website says this, and so this is, must be what I have. But instead of quoting sources, Jesus spoke directly. Like he would say, this is how it is. He spoke from his own knowledge and from his own experience. Sort of like how the doctor spoke with me. When Jesus spoke the crowds noted his words had authority. Now, what does that have to do with us today? What I want to share with you is three ways from this passage that I think Jesus' words and authority can be very relevant for us today. The first thing I want to share with you is that Jesus' words can displace the evil in our lives. Jesus' words can displace the evil in our lives. Jesus teaching in that synagogue, we're told right after he was teaching in verse 33 to 34, that in the synagogue there was a man possessed by a demon, an impure spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, Go away! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I think from this passage we can start to understand that there is evil in our world today. Actually, if you will, I offer to you that there are perhaps three sources of evil in our lives. First of all, it only takes a brief glance at the news for us to be reminded that evil exists in our world and is often practiced by human beings. There is violence, there is abuse, there is racism, there is injustice. There are laws, there are courts, there are justice systems because evil exists in our world. The second source of evil in our world, we're reminded from this passage, is that evil is not only practiced through human beings, but spiritual evil exists. 
This is not just ancient thinking. This was, of course, recorded scripture about 2,000 years ago, but as late as World War II, mid-20th century, C.S. Lewis, one of the prominent Christian writers, wrote this, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our human race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. C.S. Lewis goes on to say, the devils don't care. You could pretend they're not there, or you can give them credit for stuff that they have no credit at all to receive. They're fine either way. The truth is that spiritual evil exists. There are spiritual beings in rebellion against God. This reality that Jesus was aware of very well, and this reality that you can see in pockets of our culture, more in other cultures today, is that there is spiritual evil. Most of us, of course, most of the time, we don't give this much thought because most of the evil that most of us run into most of the time comes from human beings being self-centered and the brokenness that is already in the world. But spiritual evil does exist. And finally, the third source of evil if we're honest, and if we take a moment to give ourselves a serious look in the mirror, we ourselves, we can see, in our own selfishness, can contribute to the evil in our world. Most of us don't directly do this at all. More indirectly, like Adam and Eve eating the fruit and then treating each other with selfishness, it's not what you think of when you think of evil with a capital E. But it would bear fruit in their lives with one of their sons murdering one of their other, other sons. And so our selfishness can contribute to the evil in the world. Like, you know, when you say something sometimes in anger, the words come out, they vomit out of your mouth, and then you're like, oh my goodness, I got to bring those back. I got to catch those back, but too late, right? They've already gone out there. They've already done the damage. Evil exists in our world. No matter how much we might try to avoid thinking about it in those three ways, what do we have a tendency to do about it? One way we try to solve the evil and the brokenness in the world that we see is to change the environment that people are in. We think, well, we change the environment and then you can change the person. Right? You go to the spa, relax, right? Take it all out, right? And come back and you'll feel better. And it can work for a moment. A change of environment can work only for a moment. I remember getting my first new car some time ago. It's an incredible feeling, isn't it? Not just your a new car, but your first new car. Wow, that's an amazing feeling. I was driving youth group students around then to church and to ministry opportunities, and when they got in the car, the first thing I would tell them would be not, hello, how are you? It would be, no eating in my car. <laughs> you eat, you're on the street, because I'm kicking you out. That lasted until I started to eat in the car. <laughs> and after my first French fry fell on the floor, oh, that's it. That's no longer a new car now. Right? I started eating, and I was like, okay, I eat, you eat, we all eat, that's fine. No more new car, no more new person. You need more than a change in the environment to change a person. You need more than a spa to find peace. You can build a mansion around a broken family. It's not going to change them. A couple of weeks, you have a mansion with a broken family inside. You need more than a different place, a different building. You could have a church, a doctor's office, a prison. And it still will not displace the evil in our lives. We're told in verse 33 that this man with an impure spirit is in the synagogue. He's gathered with others together on the Sabbath during a worship service, 
He's in the synagogue, change of location, but he has not changed. It is not the environment that changes a person. What then changes somebody? What displaces the evil in their lives? Luke 4.35 tells us that Jesus responded to this man by saying, Be quiet! Jesus said sternly, Come out of him! The demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. Jesus' words. Jesus is the one with authority to displace evil in human life. There was a funny news article last week about a man in Canada, get this, who had a pregnant goat that went missing. He went to look outside for this goat in his underwear and saw a bear in his yard. He shouted and threw rocks at this bear. What do you think the bear did? The bear left his yard. I think it was the underwear. <laughs> you would have left too, right? If a human being can stand up and drive out a bear and search for his goat, then don't you think Jesus can displace evil in search for our hearts? Jesus' words are more powerful than the words from the impure spirit. This demon says, go away. And Jesus says, oh, no, you go away. And the devil, the demon, leaves. If you're looking to see a change in your own heart, if you're looking to see a change from your own tendencies towards selfishness, if you're looking to see a change from the influence of evil in your life and on your family, you need to look to the authority and the words of Jesus Christ. Jesus has authority to displace evil. The second thing I want to share with you is that Jesus' words can redeem the brokenness in our lives. Not only can he displace the evil, whatever's left behind, Jesus can redeem that. This man has an impure spirit, and it would not be far-fetched to say that because of the influence of the impure spirit, you're looking at an impure man, whatever that entails. But what does Jesus do? Jesus says to this spirit, be quiet, come out of him. And then the demon throws the man down before them all, but comes out without injuring the man. I love this because it points to what Jesus does with human beings that's so different from what we human beings do with other human beings. Jesus speaks against the evil in the man's life with authority, but he rescues the man. When we feel someone is evil or otherwise does not fit whatever mold we make that we want them to fit into, do you know what we have a tendency to do? Or maybe you don't because you're kinder than I am. I have a tendency to box them out of my life. You don't fit this mold that I want you to fit in. You don't think like me. I don't think like you. You don't like me. I don't like you. Good riddance. And whatever they've said or done, we eliminate the whole person from our care. You ever get angry at a family member? Yeah. They did one thing, but you're not talking to them at all, right? The whole person boxed out of our care. We do this with broken things. We throw them all away. But what does Jesus do? He drives out the evil and saves the man. He redeems this man's brokenness. And friends, that's what Jesus does with us. He sees the selfishness, the brokenness, the sin, even the evil in our lives. But instead of saying, good riddance, you are impure. I don't need you. You have no place with me. What does he do? He removes the sin, forgives it. The brokenness he heals, the selfishness he replaces, even the evil of our lives and its effects, he starts to redeem, bringing redemption to you and to me, saving us. 
If you need redemption, if you need restoration, not just your selfishness to be gone, but healing of pain in your life, strength to graciously endure trouble, then you've got to look to Jesus' words and authority. Jesus has authority to redeem the brokenness in our lives. And finally, if you are willing, Jesus can speak with authority in your life and shape your life. This is critically important because whatever you give authority to over your life, in your life, it will shape your life. Luke chapter 4, verse 36 to 37, all the people were amazed and said to each other, what words these are. With authority and power, he gives orders to the impure spirits, and they come out, and the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. The lives of these people gathered at the synagogue, as they start to recognize the authority of Jesus, their lives start to be shaped. They see what Jesus did, and they start to tell people about it. What Jesus did when they allow him authority, it affects their lives. The life of this man, saved from this impure spirit, is shaped by Jesus. So to whom or to what do you give authority in your life? i give you an example of how authority shapes us daily. And all of us see this happen on a daily basis with the weather forecast. I was looking for a weather forecaster that you might all recognize, but I couldn't find one without running into copyright issues, so I found this one instead. <laughs> and no, this is not me forecasting the weather because it was August, and you can see it's predicting 18 inches in Wildwood. <laughs> this is from a science display at the Franklin Institute. We had such fun with this. My point is this. The meteorologist says rain, and what do you do? You pick up an umbrella that morning. It's, the meteorologist says snow, and we get out our boots, hot weather, we get out our shorts, we give authority to them, and they shape our lives. And it's not just meteorologists. We give various leaders, influencers, news reporters, pastors, writers, thinkers, influence over our lives. And then what do we do? We make choices, investments of time and energy and money based on what they say. And not only that, we give our own thoughts so much authority in our lives. And sometimes they bring about good results. Other times they bring about worry, envy, anger, anxiety, resentment, lust, despair. We're trapped in these things. We give all these things and more authority to shape our lives. How much more should we give authority to Jesus instead? Because what Jesus says and what Jesus does is ultimately for our good. In verse 34, this demon tells us something that the people in the synagogue do not realize and something we sometimes forget. It says in verse 34, the demon speaking says, I know who you are to Jesus, the Holy One, of God. So the claim of the scriptures is that Jesus is not just a good teacher. And a lot of people think that's what Jesus is. He's a good teacher. He taught some good things. He had some great stories. He had some great values. But that's not the testimony of scripture. Not exclusively anyway. The claim of the scripture is that Jesus is not just a good teacher. Jesus is not just a good therapist. Jesus is speaks the words of God. Do you give Jesus authority in your life? 
You know what? One of the greatest wonders about God is that in his incredible, incomparable love, he lets us choose the amount of influence he has in our lives. He lets us choose whether or not we will give him authority to speak in our life. Because he doesn't want robots. He wants sons and daughters who love him and follow him out of love and receive his authority because they trust him. And so if Jesus speaks God's word, if Jesus is God, the question is, would you give Jesus ultimate authority in your life, over your life, more than commercials, more than the news, more than even your own feelings? Would you give him authority? If you and I are willing to do that, then just like Jesus freed this man, just like Jesus healed and forgave and corrected others for good, if we are willing, Jesus can speak with authority in our lives and shape our lives for good as well. What words have you given authority over your life? Maybe there were words like, you will never amount to anything. No one likes you. You're not as good looking as them, as strong as them, as rich as them, as talented as them, as tall as them, as pretty as them. What? You're not any, something as them. You're too broken. You're too addicted. You're too impure. You're too sinful. We give all these things authority in our lives. And maybe what you need to hear today is the word of Jesus instead. Friend, your sins are forgiven. Luke 5.20 I am willing to cleanse you. Be clean. Luke 5.13 Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, 3. Do not be afraid. From now on you will fish for people. Luke 5, 10. Take heart, I have overcome the world. John 16, 33. You cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve God and money. Matthew 6, 24. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. John eleven twenty eight. 28. Come, follow me. I will be with you always. Matthew 4, Matthew 28. These are better words than other words you might have given authority over your life. Would you look to the words of Jesus and give authority to him to speak into your life? If you're not yet a Christian or you're just getting started or just getting back to being serious about Jesus in your spiritual journey, then maybe one set of words you might need is John 3.16, even if you're familiar with it, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God loves you. He made you for a close personal relationship with him. Sin gets in the way of this just like sin gets in the way of every relationship. But God demonstrated his love for us by giving his son Jesus, who took on our sin, suffered our sin, our brokenness and selfishness, and died on a cross. He rose from the dead, victorious over all of that, and every single person who puts their faith in Jesus receives God's forgiveness, receives God's healing, a new life, a new identity, a new destination, a new purpose a new relationship with God. So I invite you, if you've never asked Jesus to lead you, to save you, this is the good news of the Christian faith, that you can come to Jesus not because you're impressive, but because you need him. His words invite you into a journey with him that lasts forever. He can displace the darkness. He can displace the evil. He can redeem your life. So I invite you to put your faith in Jesus. You could do that by praying to him, turning from life without God to life with God, 
committing to walk with him forever. If you do that, I encourage you to tell somebody about it, tell me about it, and join a church family so that you can walk together with others, with God. If you are a Christian and a follower of Jesus, I think most of the people that hear my voice on a weekly basis are, then I invite you to consider Jesus. Are his words more like a fortune cookie in your life? You know what you do when you open a fortune cookie? You get all excited. I wonder what it's going to say. You open it up. And if you like it, you're like, oh, God must be watching me. You don't like it. You say, what is this? You call this a fortune? Are the things that Jesus says more like a fortune cookie, more like a meteorologist, more like a therapist, or more like your loving Savior and Lord? If you're willing, one way you can invite Jesus to speak with more authority in your life is to make Scripture a regular part of your life. Read Scripture, meditate Scripture, memorize Scripture so that it fills your mind and heart. I love what this one pastor says. He says, your life is always heading in the direction of your strongest thoughts. What are your strongest thoughts? If we want our lives to head in the direction that God wants us to go, our thoughts need to be filled with Scripture. Our strongest thoughts need to be Scripture. Philippians 4.8 says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. What is your thought life filled with? Let our thoughts dwell on the words of Jesus and not just the comforting ones, but the challenging ones too. Let Jesus speak forgiveness and holiness into your life. A second way you can invite Jesus to speak with more authority in your life is to have his words affect your words. James 3.9, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father and with it we curse human beings who've been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Colossians 3, 15, 17, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with what? All wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Singing to God with gratitude in your hearts and whatever you do, whether word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You know how words can hurt you. And you know how your words have hurt others. But the amazing power of our words is they can heal also. I like how someone put it this way. Do you speak more minus words or plus words? Minus words are words that put others down. They steal life. They subtract life from people. Criticism given that is not wanting to be loving and constructive. Plus words are words that lift others up, that give life, add life to people, encourage people. If it's criticism, it's constructive, done in love. Do you speak more minus words or plus words? Let us be those who stand against what is wrong but redeem people. Finally, let your words lead others to the good news of Jesus. In this passage, when the people left the synagogue that day, they spread the news about Jesus to the surrounding area. And if you have seen the impact Jesus has had on your life, would you tell others about Jesus as you have opportunity? Because just like being in the synagogue did not change this man's life, 
It's not being in the church that changes people's lives. Rather, the church is a vessel for how Jesus changes lives. The synagogue that day got to see Jesus changing a life. And we get to see through our church, Jesus changing lives. So I encourage you to invite people to the church family, but also tell them about the one that can change their lives. Amen.